events that have shaped our time. And the efforts of man to achieve a just and lasting peace. A weekend assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses in this area has drawn attention to this religious group and their message. It's a message that stresses the need for world peace and optimistically states it will be achieved in our generation. Our guest on this program is Mr. N. H. Knorr, the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and director of the worldwide ministerial work of this religious group. Mr. Knorr, man's quest for lasting world peace has spanned thousands of years and as yet has gone unfulfilled. That's true, but particularly during the past 50 years have we seen international efforts for world peace. It is significant that uh, peace was um, unattainable despite the fact that all nations were willing to negotiate. For example, following the First World War, an international peace organization the League of Nations was established. In 1919, President Wilson made his now famous plea. The world must be made safe for democracy. President Wilson's hopes for peace were shattered. In 1920, 54 nations agreed not to resort to war. But in 1931, Japan moved into Manchuria, and in 1935, Italy attacked Ethiopia. It signaled the breakdown in the League of Nations. We asked Noor why he felt the breakdown occurred. Certainly not because of a lack of treaties. We asked Noor how Bible prophecy enters the subject. Many people are unwilling to examine the scriptures for understanding the time in which we live or trying to determine why such conditions exist. They uh, refuse to concede the Bible predicted the events occurring and peers into the future to reveal things yet to occur. Jehovah's Witnesses believe then that the Bible foretells events that have occurred or will yet occur in our lifetime? That's correct. All people would like to uh, place their confidence in man's efforts for uh, lasting world peace. But it appears many people are skeptical uh, due to the facts. Did you know, for example, that the odds against peace are phenomenal when you consider the evidence? I don't follow you. A writer of um, feature material for the New York Times observed that, quoting him now, in uh, 3,361 years of recorded history, there have been 3,134 years of war and only 227 years of peace. That's the end of his quote. The prospects for peace, according to the past performance, appears very bleak. But on Bible prophecy... The point uh, I'm trying to make is this. Why shouldn't we study the Bible from the perspective of prophecy. Why not uh, review the scriptures for the key as to why it has been this way for centuries and still continues to our day? People are human enough to wonder what the future holds. Certainly man hasn't uh, provided the answer. Only God can do that. And each Norris reliance on Bible prophecy concerning the prospects of peace to a world organization Grant began to discuss the subject in 1942. It followed the pattern of his predecessor, Rutherford, who in 1941, shortly before his death, made this statement to an international convention in St. Louis, Missouri. All the people of goodwill desire peace, whether they be of one section of the earth or the other. The righteous Lord will teach the obedient people his way, and they will walk in the way of righteousness. No more will they take instruments of war, because, as the Lord declares, nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. When in 1918 a temporary peace was declared, the people rejoiced, even though that joy was of short duration. Nor's speech in Cleveland, Ohio, September 21st, 1942, outlined the foretold appearance of a world organization 
and the purpose it would be designed to fulfill in the post-war world. Therefore, the question is a timely and urgent one. See? And at last. The answer depends upon how the peace problems are solved. The political statesmen of the world are also looking ahead to the peace anxiously. Some fear the peace worse than they do the war. Fearing for a great post-war slump. Unemployment. Dislocation of industry. Communications breakdown. International debt tangle. Anarchy and revolution in various places. Famine and pestilence and other evils. They hope that the mistakes and plunders of 1919 and following years will not be repeated. Those of a democratic mind hope for a United States of the world, a family of nations, a world association based on the United Nations, including a world legion. The United Nations organization was a hope for world peace before the end of the Second World War. On October 30th, 1943, as Noah had predicted a year earlier, the need for such an international organization was formally recognized. It was meant to be a vast improvement over the League of Nations in size, scope of activities, and in effectiveness. San Francisco, California, April 25th, 1945. That was the date for the opening session of what was called Man's Last Hope for Peace, the UN. It followed by only days the first concrete evidence the war was ending. The speaker, Secretary of State Edward Statinius. The conference with the United Nations on international organizations is now convened. We shall open the conference with one minute of silence and solemn meditation. In quick succession, the events followed. Former President Truman, May 8, 1945. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. General Douglas MacArthur accepted the Japanese unconditional surrender, September 2nd, 1945. Let us pray the peace be now restored to the world, and that God will preserve it always. The United Nations had an ambitious program. It hoped to eradicate man's basic enemies, such as hunger, disease, ignorance, and death. There was another cloud on the horizon, however, that created more concern than the atrocities of the war. It was a mushroom-shaped cloud. World War II to a sudden end opened before man the portals of a new era. Atomic power, the atom, nuclear fission, hydrogen bombs, and thermonuclear weapons became household words. The atomic race was on despite pleas for control. One such plea was made by statesman Bernard Baruch before the United Nations on June 14, 1946. I was moved in the afternoon of my life, shall I say in the last, in the late afternoon of my life, to add my effort to gain the world's quest by the broad mandate under which we were created. We of this nation desirous of helping to bring peace to the world and realizing the heavy obligations upon us Arising from our possession of the means of producing the bomb, are prepared to make our full contribution toward effective control of atomic energy. We propose this. One manufacturer of atomic bombs shall stop. There were now two divisive forces standing in the way of peace. Both of them, division of the principal nations and control of nuclear power, plagued the United Nations. How often the fond hopes expressed in the charter of the UN have been upon the lips of people around the world. In the 
first 111 articles, the Charter states that a primary purpose of the United Nations is to develop friendly relations among nations and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. But by 1950, war was present again in Korea. Former President Herbert Hoover warned of an expanded ground war in Asia. We must face the fact that to commit the sparse ground forces of the non-communist nations into a land war against this communist land mass would be a war without victory, a war without a successful political struggle. Problem disarmament and banning all weapons still present, nor combated objective. In order to achieve the uh, desired goal of peace, the United Nations hoped to divert man's efforts from the manufacture of destructive weapons of war to uh, implements of peace. This is evidenced by the uh, inscription cut in the stone wall just across from the United Nations main building. Those words were taken from the Bible, though uh, not credited to it. Now these words state, They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It was apparent that leaders of the United Nations hoped that through their efforts, this scripture would find fulfillment, Mr. Noor. Yes, I think so. For example, uh, Trigri Lee, former Secretary General of the United Nations, and former president of the General Assembly, uh, Herbert B. Ebert, apparently hoped that uh, other scriptural promises concerning peace should also be fulfilled through the United Nations. Why do you say that? Well, uh, they said on one occasion, peace on earth and goodwill to men must be made living realities. We must uh, make them living realities through the United Nations. Well, uh, this brought the scriptural ideas into play. Getting back to disarmament, Mr. Noir, do you feel this is the great stumbling block to peace? One of them, yes. How would you uh, have peace without disarmament? Maintaining peace by superior force of weapons is like two men facing each other on the street in the Old West. One false move and the other fires. Genuine peace can come, therefore only when man lives without a threat to his existence. He must be free of war and all implements of war. The prophet Isaiah, quoted on that text on the wall of the UN, makes the strongest argument on that subject. But efforts toward disarmament have proved futile, Mr. Noor. I recognize that. After its birth in 1945, one of the United Nations' first steps towards achieving its goal of peace was to establish a commission, as authorized by Article 11 of its charter, to quote, consider the principles governing disarmament and the regulation of armament, end of the quote. As a result, the Atomic Energy Commission was established during the first session of the UN in January of 1946. On January the 11th, 1952, two separate commissions were uh, replaced by the Disarmament Commission. And the weapons remain with us. The weapons remain with us. But uh, have you ever considered why the weapons are necessary in the first place? For protection from another force. That's true. But also for aggression. In other words, you need weapons because you plan to attack someone else or you expect someone to attack you. Therefore, the real problem goes beyond the weapons. It goes to the root of the matter. Why the weapon? Today, these weapons are constructed and stockpiled out of fear. Nations are convinced uh, that someone is going to attack. Many times they're right. Other nations are aggressive and plan to attack. As long as uh, these conditions exist, weapons are needed. There's no question about that. What does the record show from your point of view? Well, first, uh, some comments should be made on the gigantic obstacles that confront the UN in its early, early stages. For example, the United Nations was projected on the assumption that the friendship 
achieved by the Western powers and the Soviet uh, Union during World War II would continue indefinitely, that the veto power would be used sparingly, and that the former enemies would be restored in time to their former status, that subjected uh, nations would be given freedom of determination. None of these things came true. That's quite a list of disappointments. And uh, there were others. The UN was beset by crisis. One, China, originally on the Security Council, was forced off the mainland. The new China in power turned out to be communistic. The exploding of an atomic bomb shortly after the signing of the Charter, and that was in 1945. Uh, this blast uh, profoundly changed the security with uh, which the Charter was based. An intervention of the communist nations in many parts uh, of the world has created uh, spots of continued tension and potential conflict, such as shown by the situation in the Far East. There were treatments according to historians, were there not? Yes. Many uh, trouble spots created threats and were dealt with. Uh, Kashmir, Palestine, Indonesia, Iran, Greece, Syria, Lebanon, Berlin, Suez Canal, and the Congo. But um, what kind of peace has it been? One of force. Breaking up factions with brute power and then enforcing the peace by the same means. What you're saying, in effect, is that peace can only be achieved by understanding between nations. No, not really. What I'm saying is that peace can only be achieved through man's doing God's will. The nations are not willing to do that. The Bible states at Psalm 127, the first verse, according to a modern language translation, quote, Unless Jehovah himself builds a house, it is to no avail that its builders have worked hard on it. Unless Jehovah himself guards the city, it is to no avail that the guard has kept them. How do you think man can achieve lasting peace then? Man himself cannot and will not achieve lasting peace. Man is dependent upon God. It is a wise person who takes that into consideration in all of his undertakings. Such a person does not assume that because something appears to be good, it must have God's approval. He does not foolishly conclude that if a majority support an idea, it must be right, or that if his friends uh, condemn it, it is wrong. Wisely he seeks guidance from the word of God. The U.N. is not the end. Do you feel peace will eventually come if man himself or the United Nations is not able to accomplish it? Yes, definitely. But it will come only through God's kingdom on earth. The Bible foretold this kingdom will end all wars, provide housing, food, and health, require justice, education, and culture, and institutional international unity. That's why we pray for it to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But how? Only by God taking over completely the rulership of this earth. The governments of men will have to give way. Treaties and promises are easily broken by men. But not so with God. What he agrees to, stands. What he decrees, will come to reality. And it was God, not man, who made the promise. And they will have to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning shears. Nation will not live against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. Public Affairs Department of this station, in cooperation with the Watchtower Convention, has presented Man's Quest for Lasting World Peace, a sound study on man's efforts for world peace in our time. 
Our guest, Mr. H. Benoit, our president of the Watchtower of our Bible and Convention Extension Society, present worldwide through a true man of the ministry of the of Jehovah's Witnesses. The three-day Watchtower Convention held at the John R. Bloomfield Wording and I.O.P. School at the 1040 Top of the Road in Elm Street. I invited them that afternoon at Fritz for World Peace. PBM with a public lecture by Mr. Louis R. Beta, District Supervisor of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York. Mr. Beta will speak on the subject, True Religion versus the False. All meetings are free of charge. The three-day Watchtower Convention will be attended by some 16 congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses from Stark and Summit Counties. (laughs) 